Hello and welcome to everybody and uh, very nice good evening to all of you. After starting uh, this year with uh, the different concept of uh, case-based discussion, which was again you know, Dr. Rajesh Fogla's idea and we, we thought that was very mm -hmm. uh, relevant idea that uh, we could have a platform where we could have a case-based discussion. And then we thought of starting Journal Club and then we had an idea that uh, why don't we start one-to-one -one discussion with experts and have sort of earlier we thought of it as a coffee with expert because the idea was we have a discussion on coffee on one of the Sundays and uh, this thing but it happened to be in an awkward time of which is possibly not coffee time everywhere and hence we decided to call it uh, in conversation with expert and uh, we decided that uh, we'll start this thing. And a few days back, uh, Praveen and I, we were discussing that, uh, let's start this thing. And uh, we thought of both in unison, thought of one name, and that was Dr. Santosh Honavar. Uh, I, I really uh, think of somebody whom you would want to listen for like long hours uh, without any interruption would be, one of them would be Dr. Santosh Honavar, oozes mm -hmm. with knowledge. And every time you listen to him, you would want to make notes and you would want to uh, learn uh, things from him. Uh, not just uh, ophthalmology, but uh, the way he is in his life, uh, the meticulous nature in his every uh, ways in his life is just uh, mind boggling. Uh, so you would like to learn so many things from him and you would like to know so many things about him, which we possibly don't know. Uh, but this thing, I would welcome Dr. Santosh and uh, I'll hand over the proceeding to Praveen uh, to introduce him. Thanks, Imanshu, and uh, welcome everyone again to this uh, first of what we think is going to be an amazing series. And uh, like Imanshu was saying, this is not just a series that is going to showcase 
uh, aspects of clinical cornea as well as clinical ophthalmology, but also try and understand what makes some of the luminaries in the field what they are. Uh, and and uh, though I've been asked to introduce Dr. Honavar today, uh, I mean, I was thinking of how to introduce him, but uh, it's quite rare that you get an opportunity to introduce someone where you don't have to go online and search what their introduction is all about. So I'll start with telling you a short story. Uh, and this is, this is uh, going back in time, almost a couple of decades. Uh, when I first uh, came as a postgraduate student to a CME series that was organized in Hyderabad uh, when I was doing my residency. And as part of that CME series in Sarojini Devi Hospital, a uh, few of the faculty from Medvi Prasad Institute used to come as guest lecturers or guest faculty. And Dr. Santosh Konavar seemed to be, uh, I mean, apparently was one of them. So he came in and he spoke. I still remember he spoke about uh, ocular surface tumors. And uh, then we were sitting in the audience and uh, obviously all the girls were going gaga about him. And then we were just whispering, who is this guy? Where does he come from? What does he do? And then somebody said that uh, this is Santosh G. Honavar. And uh, G stands for Gyani. So I thought that was true then. And uh, actually that inspired me to apply for a fellowship in uh, oculoplasty. And I did apply for a fellowship in oculoplasty and cornea, though cornea was my first love. But I didn't get the seat because there was no seat available then. So I continued to pursue my career in cornea. But after joining as a fellow, I mean, obviously I came across uh, Dr. Santosh Honavar multiple times and uh, over time, there's something that somebody once said about him in uh, about 2004. They said that uh, if there is something that you can do, like tying your shoelaces and you don't think about it, if you ask Santosh how to do it, he'll tell you a better way to do it. So it's not just about ophthalmology or about oncology or about oculoplasty. It's about every aspect of being a human being that he seems to be better than most of us. So... I mean, with that background, I mean, a person who started his career uh, in Bangalore College went on to RP Center to pursue his uh, MD and then his senior residency. In fact, he trained in glaucoma, pediatric ophthalmology and oculoplasty then, and then joined LV Prasada Institute and then became the head of ocular oncology and oculoplasty and the associate director at LVPEI. Eventually, Dr. Honavar uh, was the person who started the ocular oncology service, LBPI, and then he uh, went on. Uh, before that, he trained under uh, Carol and Jerry Shields, worked with uh, Dr. Arun Singh. And then later on, he moved on to become the head of medical services and also the director of ocular oncology and oculoplasty at the Center for Sight. More recently, all of us know him as the editor of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, but in between, he also achieved uh, probably what most of us won't achieve in several lifetimes, which is prominently a recipient of the Shanti Saru Bhatnagar Award, as well as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Ophthalmology. So Dr. Santosh Hanavar is not just any ophthalmologist. He is probably somebody who's inspired generations of young ophthalmologists and cornea specialists and oncology as well as oculoplasty surgeons and he continues to do so and i can say this with pride that he is one of the people who i think continues to inspire me as well as a lot of people who i know not just in the sphere of work but also in the sphere of life so having said that welcome again dr honavar to this uh, amazing experience and thank you for being here with us to get to know you a little better, not just what you teach and what you know, but you as a person as well. Over to you, Dr. Thank you so much, Praveen. Before he starts, I want to know one more thing, Dr. Santosh. Were you as organized as kid, like how you are now? I don't, I don't think I'm organized. If I, you know, no, no, in fact, on my Zoom, you'll see how disorganized my background is. No, no, in RP Center, Santoshka notes used to go around the whole. Uh, batch of resident before us, after us, and probably, you know, even now, if you find, you might find some Xerox copies of his notes, you know, they were so meticulously written. And even his OPD papers, you know, you could say, Ki, ah, Santosh ne dekha hai, uska handwriting ye ek alag hi tha, sab, you know. So in school also, you were like this only? 
were you i don't think so <laughs> okay. okay so we all have ch- chance we still can <laughs> evolve so thank you for a very for a very kind introduction and a personalized one thank you so much i hope i deserve some of it i'll share my screen i was asked to speak on oculus surface tumors made simple for cornea specialists i don't think uh, you know cornea specialists don't know about oculus surface tumors but uh, let me co- cover the spectrum and see how i can make it simple i made it in two parts one is to uh, what which conjunctival tumors do you worry about and the second part is about some of the management advances no when you talk about a tumor it could be in the spectrum of tumors say something which is very benign to something which is highly malignant so there is always a spectrum some of the tumors are good not that you want to have a tumor but even if you want to have a tumor there are good ones there are bad ones and there are ugly ones and just by looking at them sometimes you can't figure out which one is good which one is bad and which one is ugly it's very difficult to say sometimes in a busy clinic and you have to look for certain key features in each tumor to say what it could be of course this everyone knows that it is a dermoid limbal dermoid and you generally don't worry about it you want to excise it but what are the features in limbal dermoid that would make you little careful when you excise it if there is stromal hydration at the leading edge of the tumor if there is vascularity in the stroma that is just ahead of the tumor that means that limbal dermoid is slightly more deeper than what you would want and you might want to be very careful with the excision dermal lipoma of course dermal lipoma is something that can easily be excised but there are two complications that can happen with excision of a dermal lipoma one is diplopia if you go and uh, meddle with the lateral rectus and secondly lacrimal gland palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland is very close by and if you kind of meddle with it obviously the patient may have dry as well so in dermal lipoma you do a very careful excision and the tip for dermal lipoma is that it is always anterior to the tenons it is not sub tenon so your plane of dissection should be anterior to, to the tenon so you won't even see the lateral rectus and your incision should be ahead of the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland so something that can mimic dermal lipoma but again not dangerous something very benign in elderly individuals is orbital fat prolapse this is bilateral and these patients tend to be stocky and tend to have short neck and if you look at dermal lipoma and this you see the color is very striking dermal lipoma is pale yellow whereas this is slightly pink and it always has a crevice to it if you want to excise it you have to be a little more careful than dermal lipoma because this tends to be subtenons so you may encounter lateral rectus insertion when you try to excise a orbital fat prolapse now going on to uh, some of the other congenital abnormalities if you have a child like this or a middle aged or adult like this with bilateral choristoma doesn't really look like a dermoid but it is congenital it is at the limbus you can see bilateral limbus limbal lesions slightly irregular part of it is vascular child also has a shallow coloboma in the left upper lid has multiple notches and appendages in the right upper lid and has a subcutaneous nodule there and multiple cutaneous pigmented lesions there this is something dangerous this is a cancer predisposition syndrome called nevus sebaceous of yadesen these children also tend to have bald patches on the scalp and pigmented nevi on the face chest and abdomen they are predisposed to have basal cell carcinoma squamous cell carcinoma and other systemic malignancies so you should be very aware of this condition it may not be as striking as this in this child even if you have a bilateral flattish irregular limbal lesions which are congenital and along with that if a child has a vascularized lesion in the ocular surface and has boil patches on the scalp then you should suspect nevus sebaceous of yadesen and these children need to be under constant follow up now this you may occasionally see when it, when you you know look at a patient for, as part of comprehensive eye evaluation if you see this clear cyst or cyst with some kind of a fluid inside you don't have to worry about it this is lymphangiectasia or a very early lymphangioma so you don't have to worry about it but these t- patients tend to have spontaneous subconjunctival hemorrhage so when the hemorrhage resolves you may see some of this cyst residual and that tips you off that the reason for subconjunctival hemorrhage was indeed a 
lymphangiectasia or a small lymphangioma. Even this is something that you don't have to worry about unless it's a cosmetic challenge. Well, of course, you can excise it. But this is a conjunctival lymphangioma, which can now be treated easily with either pisibanil or bleomycin as intralesional injections or a larger lesion, which may look very fierce, but you know because of the cysts within it and recurrent hemorrhages that it is likely to be lymphangioma. And also this is very characteristic, this irregular vasculature within it at the advancing age is very characteristic. If you want to excise it, then you may have a little more bleeding than what you would want. So currently the treatment of choice is simple vaporization. So you either use carbon dioxide laser or um, a radio frequency electrode tip to vaporize the lesion. It, it easily gets vaporized. And you can relay the ocular surface with amniotic membrane with excellent results. There's no bleeding at all. So you can avoid those complications. Of course, you can even inject this with bleomycin, but since it's so close to cornea, there could be some corneal issues. Now, coming on to little more pinker lesions, this is something that you would always want to worry about. This is a lymphoproliferative lesion. The pale pink color cannot be missed. This is very, very typical salmon pink or pale pink lesion especially if it is disappearing under the upper eyelid into the fornix, definitely you would worry about this a lymphoproliferative lesion. We can't say whether it is lymphoma or benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia or atypical lymphoid hyperplasia. Just by looking at it, you have to biopsy it. So whenever you see a pale pink lesion, never hesitate to biopsy and take a good chunk of it and send it to a pathologist with the clinical suspicion that it is a lymphoproliferative lesion. If it turns out to be benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia or atypical lymphoid hyperplasia, then topical steroids, systemic steroids and observation because one may turn into other, it's a spectrum. Atypical lymphoid hyperplasia may turn into lymphoma. But if it is lymphoma, then it's most likely mild lymphoma. These patients need systemic investigations and further treatment. I'll el elaborate on the treatment a little later. If you have little more fiery looking reddish lesion with a prior history of say uh, retinal detachment surgery, etc. then you should think of pyogenic granuloma. These are associated with spontaneous bleeding and also discharge in the cul-de-sac. All that you need to do is look for a suture or some kind of a reason why this pyogenic granuloma has occurred. And if you don't find any, then you can simply uh, remove it or treat with topical steroids. Something which is dangerous now. This is a lesion in a young adult who is HIV seropositive, and this is Kaposi sarcoma of the ocular surface. Clinically, it's very difficult to say unless the history is forthcoming, history of being immunosuppressed is forthcoming. But what is said is that medulla had like vasculature coming from all layers of the ocular surface, including intrascleral channels supplying this very rapidly growing lesion. You can see large blood vessels feeding it. And also subconjunctival hemorrhages, which are away from the lesion, indicate that it is a Kaposi sarcoma. Currently, the treatment of choice for Kaposi sarcoma is in initiation of heart therapy, with which it spontaneously resolves. But if the patient is already on heart therapy, then you have to excise it and probably give radiation. Now, going on to some other dangerous tumors, this is a patient who has unilateral red eye. Unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis, which is not resolving with any conservative treatment, for a finite, say, three or four months of time. When you look at it carefully, you find that there is some kind of a vascular flattish growth or on the cornea, obliteration of the limbal definition. And when you flip the eyelid, you find that the eyelid margin is grossly thickened as compared to normal eyelid. Posterior lid margin is all rounded and you don't see any mebumin gland orifices. So this is obvious that the patient has vegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma, which can manifest on the bulbar surface exactly like this. So unless you flip the lid and look at the eyelid features in this patient, because this is a primarily an eyelid malignancy, which encroaches on the ocular surface. So unless you look at the eyelid manifestations, you will miss the diagnosis. And eyelid manifestations need not always have a nodular or a nodular ulcerative tumor that we are familiar with with, but it can be no tumor at all. You don't see a manifest tumor, but it could still be pejetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma. The way to diagnose it is by doing a MAP biopsy because you want to know the extent of the lesion as well. 
so that you can take appropriate therapeutic measures. This is how we do a MAP biopsy, 17 sites of biopsy from perilimbal conjunctiva, inferior, superior fornix, inferior and superior palpebral, lateral canthus, and plica carinkle. So they're all sent to a pathologist and pathologist would confirm which all of these is positive. Based on that, you decide on whether to treat with topical mitomycin, cryotherapy, excise the conjunctiva, or even do orbital excentration. So never miss Pegetoid, sebaceous gland carcinoma, mask rats as unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis, and any unilateral chronic blepharoconjunctivitis which does not respond to conservative therapy for a finite period of time warrants MAP biopsy. And what we necessarily do is a MAP, um, MAP biopsy, obviously. Okay. Now, unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis, one more cause is this. What is seen here strikingly is dots of keratin. So it looks exactly like the previous case that I showed you, but has additional feature that is dot of keratin or a bit of keratin. So whenever there is keratin, that means that you're dealing with an epithelial tumor. Keratin is nothing but a manifestation of epithelial cell turnover, high rate of epithelial cell turnover. And that happens only in ocular surface squamous neoplasia. I'm showing both head to head now. This is pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma, had eyelid features. This is diffuse OSSN with keratin, will not have eyelid features. So just this bit of keratin will help you diagnose one from the other. Now this looks like peripheral ulcerative keratitis, some of my old collection where you see that there is a gutter, somebody had done a conjunctival resection, glue BCL for the peripheral corneal thinning. Maybe at that time it may not have been present, but later, six months later, the patient's present with a scleral nodule and a patch of keratin there. So this was a variant of ocular surface squamous neoplasia called mucoepidermoid variant, which can have steril invasion very early on. This patient presented with what looks like sterile corneal melt, but had a lot of keratin at the time the picture was taken. Patient was treated with a patch graft as appropriate, but when that necrotic material was sent to the pathologist, the diagnosis was ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So it can even present simulating a corneal melt. Now, uh, it can even look like necrotizing scleritis. This does look like necrotizing scleritis. It is necrotizing scleritis, but not the immune-mediated variant, but the tumor-related necrotizing scleritis. You can see a lot of keratin there, and of course, necrosclera and the UF prolapsing through. Even on that, there are patches of keratin. So OSSN can present like this as well. So these are the mask rats of OSSN. In fact, there are many more mask rats of OSSN, huge spectrum. And the so-called typical OSSN also has a spectrum. There's a wide spectrum. One does not look like the other. So if you have such a vast clinical manifestation, how do you diagnose it? So you look at uh, not one, but multiple clinical features. Keratin is good. It is sensitive and specific to the diagnosis of OSSN, where histopathology is the gold standard. Add to keratin abnormal vascular pattern, as you see here, that increases sensitivity and specificity a little bit more. But if you want much higher sensitivity and specificity as close to the gold standard, then you add rose bengal staining. So if the area stains with rose bengal, even patchy staining with rose bengal is indicative that it is OSSN and it gets very close to the gold standard, 97% specific and 98% sensitive and 98% specific, which means that if you look at something which looks like inflammatory on the ocular surface, may look like inflammatory lesion, but it has keratin, it has abnormal vascular pattern and also stains with rose bengal, then there's a very high possibility that it may turn out to be ocular surface squamous neoplasia and you should treat it like that. So that is the lesson from this study that we did. Now, if you have a doubt at all, then right now, of course, OCT is the you know, diagnostic tool of choice. Uh, Carol Karp has very nicely described the features of anterior segment OCT for OSSN. This is normal corneal epithelium, nice and gray, but if it turns hyperplastic and hyperreflective and ends abruptly like that, like a snout, that is descriptive, very characteristic of OSSN. And you can use OCT signs as a characteristic diagnostic signs for OSSN. This is pterygium, no doubt. You have no doubt at all, but something that can actually drag the blood vessels. You can see the vascular pattern in pterygium all narrow blood vessels which are dragged towards the lesion, right? This is possibly an atrophic region. But when you have blood vessels which are of different caliber, 
so you can see different caliber thick thin all not really drag towards the lesion but are very lazily you know coming towards the lesion and the apex of the lesion has some kind of vascularity and a papillary growth so this may not be as dramatic as this even a pterygium which looks like this may have a little bit of papillary growth on top of it so that could even be an oocyst so oocyst can simulate a pterygium now if you find a lesion like this away from the limbus well you don't have to worry too much about it it's a benign tumor called conjunctival stromal tumor or cost it looks like a pingiculum but pingiculum is generally at the limbus but this is away from the limbus this is conjunctival stromal tumor but when you have something which is similar at the limbus you worry about it because that is oocyst and oocyst is a tumor of the limbal stem cell so it is at the limbus let's go on to pigmented conjunctival lesions now pigmented conjunctival lesions the main ones are these complexion associated melanosis called cam primary acquired melanosis called pam nevus and a melanoma the complexion associated melanosis or racial melanosis all of us have if you look at your own ocular surface carefully you will have little bit of pigment here and there and people who work outdoors and are exposed to actinic radiation are more likely to have it but it is bilateral it is nearly symmetrical maybe slight amount of asymmetry may be there but not gross asymmetry it has this micro folds called cobblestones and tarsal involvement is less common so it is confined to generally the bulba conjunctiva little bit of pigmentation of the eyelid margin may also be seen has cobblestone pattern and bilateral and nearly symmetrical this is typical complexion associated melanosis so if you have a patient like this you really don't have to worry about it. but once there is asymmetry like this you can see the right eye is grossly pigmented if the left eye were also to be equally pigmented you possibly may not worry about it but left eye is all white i won't say all white there is a little bit of pigmentation which is consistent with the patient's age and race but this eye is grossly asymmetrically pigmented that is primary acquired melanosis primary acquired melanosis has lot of connotations because primary acquired melanosis is something that is can be dangerous it happens in middle aged individuals typically unilateral flat pigmentation no cyst and has a risk to melanoma now the risk of melanoma varies from study to study and this is one study which is uh, shown that uh, there is a high incidence of melanoma almost in one third of patients whereas the will study showed in it about 10% but very clear that pam with atypia has a risk of melanoma and pam without atypia does not have a risk of melanoma and the only way to differentiate whether a pam has atypia or not is by doing a biopsy otherwise how else will you diagnose it's very difficult size is of course a criteria for every clock our uh, in one second let me just clear this up. yeah for every clock hour extent of a pam there is an increased risk that has been worked out by the shield so a larger the pam more is the risk so if you looking at a larger unilateral pigmented lesion which is uh, say 3 or 4 clock hours in size then you are justified in actually excising it and sending it for pathology if you look at the spectrum of conjunctival melanoma what is the etiology we always think that Oh, conjunctival melanoma occurs de novo, which is not true. Pam is the most important cause for conjunctival melanoma, whether it is in Asia or is in Caucasian population. Seventy-five percent of melanomas are co caused by a pre-existing primary acquired melanosis, which would have come to somebody's attention as an ophthalmologist at some point in time, may or may not. Whereas de novo is only twenty percent, and nevus is a very paltry. 5% so we don't worry too much about nevi getting malignant but we definitely worry about pam being malignant especially if a pam is fornicial then there is a higher chance of it turning malignant you can see a fornicial pam here and you can see a medial melanoma so 20 to 30% of cases grossly poor so whenever a patient has primary acquired melanosis you worry about it and you try to biopsy it now when you biopsy it it's better that you completely excise it if it is excisable easily without causing functional problems and uh, get rid of it and do the edge cryotherapy if it is not excisable if it is large then you do a map biopsy 
Now going on to a different spectrum of conjunctival lesions, these are four teenagers, I would say, all with a conjunctival lesion. Now, which one of these is an evus and which one of these is a melanoma is something which is not very difficult to say. But sometimes you may get confused looking at these blood vessels. You can see books write that nevi don't have feeder vessels. But in the last 100 nevi that I have seen, each one of them had a feeder vessel. So nevi do have feeder vessels, but maybe one or two, whereas melanoma will have a large number of feeder vessels. So this is the checklist that I have for differentiating a nevus from a melanoma. About 80-90% of nevi are in interpalpebral location. So if you have a lesion which is within the palpebral fissure, then most likely it is a nevus. Nevi have variable pigmentation starting from very pale brown to dark chocolate brown. All kinds of range of entire range of pigmentation of brown spectrum is there in a nevus, whereas melanoma is dark chocolate, dark or extremely vascular, causing a reddish hue. Nevi don't have corneal epithelial invasion. They just stop short at the limbus. Very rarely do they invade the cornea. Now you may ask me whether this would have corneal invasion or no. That is just a pregnant nevus or a bulky nevus which is overhanging the cornea. If it were to be true corneal invasion, then you would have pigment and irregular surface and vascularization, everything going along with the pigmented lesion onto the corneal epithelium. Otherwise, it stops very crisply at the corneal limbus. Nevi don't have episcleral fixation. It's easy to test. You just move the nevus with a, a cotton-tipped applicator and it moves on the bulbous surface, whereas melanoma is affixed to the tenons and also to sclera. Nevi don't have intrinsic vascularity. What I mean by that is that if you look at it very carefully, there are no large caliber blood vessels within the lesion, but this kind of a feeder vessel is possible in a nevus. Nevi very typically have microsis. So that's something that you can see on slit lamp. But if you miss on slit lamp, then of course, imaging will help you in diagnosing a microsis. Microsis and macrosis are very typical of a nevus. Nevi are spongy, whereas melanoma is solid. If you don't find cysts within a pigmented lesion, then you worry about it. It could be a melanoma that you're dealing with. How is it clinically applicable? Very um, high-strung parents, physician parents of this young child brought this child over, said that they noticed it just about a month ago and it is, you know, fleshy, it has vascularity, it looks like as if it has vascularity within it and it has overshot the limbus. So somebody said it's a malignant lesion, it has to be excised. Well, it is possible it's a malignant lesion, but let's do the scan and then you see microsis. So it's an amelanotic lesion, amelanotic nevus and cysts actually confirm the diagnosis. So microsis is the hallmark, whether it's melanotic or amelanotic nevus, nevi do have microsis. Now, second important application of microsis is that they disappear when the nevus turns into a melanoma. So this patient had macrosis, very obvious macrosis. One year later, patient had a new growth and that did not have cysts at all. So nevi turning into melanoma lose their cysts and become more solid, more vascular. This, of course, is amelanotic. This is one of my own patients who had uh, been following up with me for a long duration of time. He was, as a kid, following up with me. He had this nevus right here. You can still see variable pigmentation, microsis, etc. But recently, he has developed this dark chocolate dark nodule with some areas of abnormal vascularity, subconjunctival hemorrhage. Now, this patient, we did a UBM at that time. So he has microsis, which continue to be there in the area that is excised, that is a nevus. He has a solid component that does not have microsis, and that is melanoma. So this is the zone of transition from this nevus to a melanoma. This melan nevus has converted it into a melanoma and has lost the microsis. So there are clinical relevance to finding microsis and losing microsis. So, in uh, summary for pigmented lesion, which conjunctival pigmented lesion would you worry about? Definitely not this, especially if it is bilateral, symmetrical or nearly symmetrical, cobblestone appearance, perilimbal pigmentation, leaving the phonesis, palpable conjunctiva intact. This is, this is complexion associated with melanosis. Whereas if it is unilateral, it has peppery pigmentation, involves the lid margin and also 
phonics and the palpable conjunctiva. This is PAM and you should worry about it. This is something which is pigmented slightly away from the limbus. Interpalpable bulbar conjunctiva has obvious cysts. That is a nevus. Whereas this is a melanoma, hungry tumor, getting blood supply from all the layers, episcleral, intrascleral, conjunctival, all channels coming to feed it, involving the cornea, chocolate, dark area, area of vascularity. That is a nodular lesion melanoma for sure. So conjunctival lesions, I would say not to worry, simply recognize and manage. So can I go to the next part, Himanshu? Sure, sure. We can go, but <laughs> we'll... we'll... We'll discuss. Stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. So, a uh, few things uh, we want to know about uh, you, as in, like, what does Santosh do in free time? Do you actually have free time? And what do you do in free time? I do have free time. I sleep. I listen to some Hindi old music. That's okay. Read a bit. And do you watch movies and all those things like Mortal Souls like us? or I do watch movies. Pushpa was my last movie. Oh, okay. Not bad. Well, that's... So you're Fairly quite updated in that way. <laughs> okay. And how, how does Santosh get angry? How do you make Santosh angry? Most of them, we keep seeing you smiling only. I don't know whether you're angry or not. You still keep smiling. Yeah. The so... smile is deceptive. Yeah, smile is deceptive. I, I do get angry and um, for, you know, some very stupid reasons. So, that's my weakness. Okay. So, uh, Praveen, you want to ask something? No, no. You, when you asked about anger, I think you also remember, Himanshu, that uh, when we used to share that office mm. and uh, we used to actively avoid crossing paths with... Uh, Santosh, especially when the smile was wiped off the face, because then you knew that there was this slight tilt to the head, uh, slight like uh, bent arm, carrying his files, looking straight ahead or looking down. Everybody knew that they had to like, move away. So yeah, that is uh, sometimes, but in general, uh, I think the smile is sort of deceptive. But uh, what I ask one question that uh, there are all. Uh, Praveen, I lost you. I don't know whether Santosh could yeah, hear you. All of us lost. Yeah. Oh, can you repeat? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. now can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. No, I was just talking about the deceptive smile and uh, also how uh, when you saw Santosh, without the smile, everybody knew that you have to clear the way for him and we not cross that, his path. So, uh, we didn't get Question part we didn't get the question was the fact that did you ever consider becoming a corneal surgeon instead of a plasty and an ocular oncology specialist? Okay, why plasty uh, and ocular oncology? You know, became one actually, and because Vajpayee and Mahipal were my mentors in Api Center, you know, about writing papers and all, I used to collaborate with Vajpayee and he would just give me a case and I would write and he was very sure that I would take up cornea. And in fact, I got cornea senior residency, which I didn't want to do. So, Murali Krishnamachari took up Konya as senior residency and I waited for some time to take up Ocular Plus. I'll give one anecdote about uh, you. I mean, the, this is something which actually changed my perspective in life. So, so both uh, him and I, we used to eat a little late. So, we would be like having lunch together uh, in LVP canteen around 3 o'clock or something like that. And then I would be talking to him and once I asked him that... Uh, why do you help your fellow? Now, mind you, Santosh uh, had uh, this thing as organized he is. He could actually decide that which is the right time to talk to Dr. Rao. When is the right uh, time to think about uh, the future expansion and all those kind of things. And he would groom a person into to that uh, level that, okay, this is the right time. This is how you... Uh, go next step or something. So once I asked him that, why would you do that? I mean, I don't see anybody doing that. And he said, uh, well, it's not about anybody else. It's about me that if I want to grow, if I want to do something which I uh, like to do, 
then i have to have a person next to me and then only it will allow me to groom myself into the person whom i want to become otherwise i can't take leaves i can't do anything at all in my life and i will be just dragging myself and that change the perspective in my mind that many times we start thinking as a next people next generation as our competitors but in fact they are our facilitators they are the one who will help us to do what we want to do and that was something really eye opening uh, santosh and i really uh, remember all those words uh, till date and I, i seriously feel that each one of us should have uh, this attitude thank you yeah couple of questions i think about uh, what you said so far as well i think clinical questions now uh, but uh, uh, one question from dr nidhi gupta was how can we differentiate necrotizing scleritis that presents as a case of ossn with secondary infarction at presentation i think this comes from the picture that you showed okay so keratin is a harm you know in fact ossn the picture i showed you also had keratin and if you have any doubt at all uh, just harvest a little bit of conjunctiva from the margin and then do a histopath that will confirm the diagnosis so generally keratin is present in patients who have necrotizing scleritis with because of ossn i haven't seen any patient without it i think as a follow up to that there's another question from dr reshma mehta who asks about uh, the feature of keratin uh, can you elaborate or repeat how you use keratin to diagnose uh, ossn okay keratin can be intra epithelial and it can be above the surface of the epithelium keratin is it's it's the most superficial layer of epithelium basically it is a product of epithelial cell turnover now if you find keratin within the lesion or powdery keratin on top of the lesion then that indicates that there is a high epithelial cell turnover and for that there has to be a reason and the reason generally is a epithelial cell tumor it's a indirect indicator that you are looking at a malignancy it does not happen in sebaceous gland carcinoma a sebaceous gland carcinoma the only variant that ha- has keratin is the bovenoid variant jacobiak has classified uh, intra epithelial sebaceous gland carcinoma into pegetoid bovenoid and papillary i thought it will little more advanced for con specialists to know but the bovenoid variant also has keratin thank you uh, we think we should move on to the next segment of the presentation so that we get more questions okay. yeah slide c am i slide c yes okay so i'll go about uh, talking about recent advances in the management of ocular surface tumors and talk a bit about topical therapy surgery plaque brachytherapy on which there are some questions and target therapy as well now topical therapy in ocular surface tumors is not really new but what we have uh, now done is we have defined the indications and we know when does it work best and when not to use it there are two ways of looking at topical therapy one is chemotherapy mitomycin and 5 fluorouracil are chemotherapeutic agents interferon is immunotherapy sildenafil is for very specific lesions and it was described but i don't think it's being used anymore now what are the indications indications are again classified into three but before that let's just have a overview of the drugs the least expensive is 5 fluorouracil mitomycin and interferon per month cost is almost the same fifu is somewhere in between mitomycin c and interferon in terms of efficacy and rapidity of action uh, mitomycin has more ocular surface complications interferon has almost none five few comes somewhere in between now when we use topical therapy it is for three purposes either of the three purposes one is complete tumor control when you call it immunotherapy when you want to reduce the size of the lesion for example if you have a nine clock over lesion and you want to reduce it in size so that you can do a smaller or a less extensive surgery that's called immuno reduction or chemo reduction same principle as we use in retinoblastoma immunomodulation is specific to interferon where you want to enhance the local immune system this seems to be work in patients who are hiv positive who have multifocal ossn recurrent ossn or post organ transplant immunosuppression patients 
or even patients with xeroderma pigmentosum where they have mild multifocal recurrences or multiple recurrences if you keep them on once a day dose of interferon the, the chance of local tumors coming back or new tumors coming back would be much less so immunotherapy is mainly for small tumors like this tumors which are say two clock hours or three or four millimeter placoid lesions they work very well with immunotherapy also for local recurrences a small recurrence in a prior excised patient gone away with topical therapy most important application for topical therapy is corneal oocysts when the tumor is on the cornea this case i remember vividly this was a patient with corneal oocysts in where my cornea colleague had done a biopsy just to confirm what it is and he happened to do biopsy in this area 3 years later of course the patient regressed with topical therapy that is exactly the area where you find a small residual scar Right. So, if you were to do excision, primary excision in this patient, possibly you would have some scar in the pupillary axis, just precluding good vision. So, whenever there is a oocysts in the pupillary axis or on the cornea, we, it goes off very beautifully with topical therapy. You really don't have to surgically excise these lesions. Example is this patient who has a very very flat oocysts in the pupillary axis. This would work very well with topical therapy. Now this was a difficult situation. This patient's other eye, and uh, I think Virendra Sagmat's patient, other eye had uh, um, already gone into thysis. This patient had the third graft possibly uh, referred after the second graft to LVPI, and then the third graft was done, and the graft was surviving for a long time, and suddenly the patient comes with a lesion which is about three clock hours right at the graftose junction. Patient with zero derma pigmentosum, they're known to have this kind of tumors. this was at the graftose junction and there were some dm folds etc some graft edema this patient obviously could have been managed surgically but that could have tipped the uh, graft in favor of say a graft rejection or a failure but then topical therapy worked beautifully well in this patient you can see after 6 weeks of interferon the tumor is all gone so this patient is again a very clear indication for topical therapy and not for surgery next is extensive tumors which are more than 6 clock hours so you all realize that if you meddle with the limbus too much then there could be limbal stem cell deficiencies so if you want a scarless healing if you don't want to do surgery and yet want a scarless healing then you can go for topical therapy this patient resolved very beautifully after about 3 months of treatment so interferon takes time to work it's not that it works in 4 weeks or 6 weeks you have to keep on giving interferon till the tumor completely goes away and you see no recurrence at all so for about 6 weeks after complete regression you would continue to give interferon to these patients this was a patient who had about 9 clock hours of limbal involvement a very flat tumor again took about 3 months for it to go away but then there is no scarring at all so generally the lesions which are flat like that placoid ones which respond very well to topical therapy but if you have a nodular lesion which is more elevated than broad that does not respond very well to topical therapy and the, those are often chosen for surgical intervention so injection interferon works in patients who have extensive or diffuse lesions this patient again had diffuse involvement of the bulbar as well as palpebral conjunctiva almost a case for orbital excentration but here injection interferon worked well three injections given three weekly followed by topical therapy this patient resolved and has remained regress uh, well this does not happen in all patients i would say about 50% of patients resolve with injection interferon and other 50% may need extensive surgery or orbital excentration hiv positive patient ocular surface entire ocular surface involved regressed with injection interferon now immunoreduction is a concept where you want to shrink the tumor down so that you can do less extensive surgery the concept is very simple if this is the limbus and if this is the limbus and this is the tumor this tumor the center or the epicenter is the invasive component of the tumor or likely to be invasive component of the tumor around which there would be a zone of carcinoma in situ severe moderate and mild dysplasia and that stems down to normal conjunctiva now what interferon or chemotherapy does is it takes care of invasive of carcinoma in situ and dysplasia and leaves the invasive component behind so this was the invasive squamous cell carcinoma that was left behind everything else has resolved with topical therapy now you're only left with this particular part of the tumor to excise 
So this is the concept. So if you want to do a less extensive surgery, then you reduce it to the size possible after six weeks or three months of therapy, watching the patient all through that if a patient does not respond, some patients uh, actually increase in size despite topical therapy, they want immediate intervention. Otherwise, you can wait on uh, regression and then excise what is residual. Immunomodulation, I already explained in patients who have a higher chance of new tumors, you put them on once a day dose of interferon and that seems to work pretty well. What is important about topical therapy is case selection. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages for against topical therapy, but what is most important is case selection. When the diagnosis is in doubt like this, patients who have a sebaceous gland carcinoma, obviously you should not choose for interferon or topical therapy. When you're not sure about the depth of the lesion. Now, this patient was started on topical therapy and this is one example where despite topical therapy, the lesion has increased in size. This is because, uh, you know, your depth was missed. It was actually in the sclera already at the time it was present, the patient presented. And these patients don't at all work well with topical therapy. In fact, they increase despite topical therapy. When you're not sure of patient compliance, again, it's not a case for topical therapy. Obviously, patients who don't use drops well or don't store these drops well, are not reliable candidates for topical therapy and they should uh, come to surgical excision. When you talk about surgery, you talk about surgery with tumor-free margins. And how exactly do you determine tumor-free margins? By a good slit lamp evaluation aided by Rose Bengal state. So you take a large diagram of the tumor along with you to the operation theater. For the corneal epithelial component, we want to protect the Bowman's membrane. So you always use alcohol-assisted keratoepithelectomy not to disturb Bowman's as far as possible. Lamellar keratectomy and sclerectomy are generally not done because we have the advantage of plaque brachytherapy. Cryotherapy to resection edge is mandatory. That gives you an additional 3 to 4 millimeter advantage over subclinical tumor, which cannot be otherwise seen. And Cryotherapy to resection base is optional. If you see that during excision, a one part, one clock cover of the tumor is going slightly deeper into the corneal or uh, scleral stoma, then you can cryo that area. This is the kind of diagrams you were taught to draw. Um, this was, of course, a diagram of a melanoma, but you can see the details in the diagram. We have drawn exactly what is the configuration of the lesion, where exactly is it located, and what parts are to be excised, and what is the number that we give on excision, how we lay it on a filter paper, and what is the dimension of each. This makes it easier because if you have a habit of giving peribulbar block, sometimes the details of the lesion may get blunted when you give peribulbar block because of chemosis, etc. And if you have a diagram like this, it always helps you recollect the exact extent of the lesion, or you can take a digital photograph of the patient. The surgery is very, very simple. Nothing at all for a cornea, especially you let's do such sophisticated complex surgery. This is extremely simple surgery, but the oncological principles are to be followed. That is at least four millimeter clinically clear margin after having determined the maximum dimension of the lesion by doing staining. Base has to be, depth of the lesion has to be determined by doing an OCT. So base clearance and margin clearance are both oncological principles and they need to be respected. Which instrument do you use to excise is totally a personal choice. I don't have any preference over the other. I use RF and that's alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy. After trying the rest of the cornea, you apply alcohol to the leading edge of the tumor, about two to three, three millimeter away from the leading edge and scroll off the corneal epithelium towards the limbus. We have already reached the limbus from the conjunctival side. Now we are reaching the limbus from the corneal side. It's a limbal tumor, so you had to finally excise it off the limbus. So now we see the limbus right there. Now we stop there and then excise the lesion off the limbus under visualization. Some surgeons believe in a dry technique, but dry is never dry. It is full of blood. So it's better to either irrigate it or keep mopping or swabbing very gently so that you see what you're excising, the base. Then comes edge cryotherapy. The edge of the conjunctiva is draped over a 3 millimeter cryoprobe and frozen and allowed to thaw spontaneously, double freeze-thaw cryotherapy. 
This gives you an additional three to four millimeter advantage. There could be a subclinical tumor in this area. So if you don't do edge cryotherapy, then the chance of recurrence is higher, which we have already determined. This patient had a slight amount of deeper lesion. That's what clinically looked like. So we are doing base cryotherapy as well. You can safely do base cryotherapy for two, three clock hours without any risk of limbal stem cell deficiency. And rest of it, of course, the repair is your choice. Again, you can use uh, sutured amniotic membrane, glued amniotic membrane, conjunctival autograph. It's absolutely personal choice. So whichever that works for you, you can definitely use. And rest of the amniotic membrane is trimmed. And that's how the patient looks at the end of surgery. These are some of the late post-operative follow-ups. And what, what is important to stress is that uh, whatever that you see on OCT that is mimicked on histopath. So what edge, of course, is easily visible, but sometimes base becomes difficult to visualize. And if you have a habit of doing OCT in all these patients, you can estimate the depth of the lesion. For example, this patient, it's only involving the conjunctiva and tenons is all free. So your plane of dissection is going to be episcleral or subtenons. So you leave a layer of free tenens, which is a safe zone to leave. So depth assessment is always by OCT. Now you can do always a primary select if you want to protect against limb stem cell deficiency. Going a little faster now, this is a patient who has diffuse conjunctival melanoma. Of course, here the treatment of choice is excision and again with free margins. And mel with melanoma, especially if it's involving the eyelid margin, then you want to do frozen section as well because you want to get a free margin there also. So this is how the patient looks following treatment. Ocular surface can easily be reconstructed. So surgery remains definitely an excellent option. Now what's recent is the way we give adjuvant therapy. This is the protocol currently for adjuvant therapy. If resection edge is positive and it has only carcinoma in situ or dysplasia, if you have already done resection edge cryotherapy, you can opt to observe or do topical therapy. If the resection edge is positive and has invasive squamous cell carcinoma, then you have no choice, at least for medical legal purposes, to re accept re-excision. So if resection edge is positive with invasive squamous cell carcinoma, you have to re-excise. If resection base is positive and if the pathologist is able to localize it to a particular clock hour, you can go back and cryo that particular clock hour. If resection base is diffusely positive, then you have no other option but to do plaque break therapy. That is the protocol for adjuvant treatment. Now, for patients who may not be primarily operable, like this patient who has full thickness or nearly full thickness, scleral invasion or anterior segment angle invasion. Earlier, the dictum was that if a patient has intraocular extension of OSSN, go ahead and do either anterior excentration or extended enucleation. It's not true because if a patient has iris melanoma, what do you do? plaque brachytherapy. If a patient has ciliary body melanoma, what do you do? Plaque brachytherapy. If a patient has a ciliary body extension of OSSN, what do you do? You can do plaque brachytherapy. So if melanoma is more dangerous, OSSN is less dangerous, then why do you want to sacrifice the eye just because the patient has a deeper invasion? We can definitely try to salvage these patients. So plaque has come to the rescue. This patient, you can see uh, sclera is nice, avascular, tectonically stable. Sclera doesn't melt so easily with 6,000 centigrade of radiation. For melanoma, we give 10,000 centigrade and the apex dose is calculated for 6 millimeter, whereas here it's just for 2 millimeter and 6,000 centigrade. Sclera takes uh, such heavy radiation very easily and it's very friendly to the sclera. So these patients do very well. One more patient with scleral invasion done fairly well with plaque brachytherapy. So either you excise it and wait for the pathologist to tell you whether the base is involved and then do plaque brachytherapy. That is called secondary plaque brachytherapy. But in patients who have a tumor like this, where there is stomal melt, etc., and you are always worried about tectonic integrity of the eye, whether you'll be able to repair it or not, if you were to excise it. So what is happening at the base? If there is any necrotic sclera there, would there be a perforation? then you can do plaque right on top of the tumor. That's called primary plaque brachytherapy. Both work well, primary as well as secondary. Just that you have to have histopathological evidence. You might do just do a small biopsy and apply plaque right on top of the tumor. Like this patient also had plaque right on top of the tumor. Already know his histopath because he, had, he was excised earlier elsewhere. 
to send for a recurrence and we could do plaque right on top of the tumor. Now, melanoma sometimes are difficult. This was a previously excised melanoma elsewhere, now diffusely recurrent, you can see, but the patient has 6-9 vision and wants to save his eye. He also has slight amount, you can see the ciliary processes on imaging and you can have, uh, this patient has ciliary body extension as well localized. Of course, you can do orbital excentration, but short of it, you can excise it and do what is called a rotation plaque brachytherapy. That means we treat this part of the eye and then we treat this part and then we treat this part, three or four rotations of the plaque all along the areas where the tumor is. This patient is doing very well. It's about two, two and a half years of follow-up has no recurrence and has no metastasis. So the, something new is a plaque that PARC is trying to make for us. This is an experimental design where both the sides of this simplifron ring kind of a device has ruthenium and it can treat both the palpebral as well as the bulba conjunctiva simultaneously. We used to have exactly similar design earlier again in experimental device. Now that's gone out of India. So uh, we are requesting BARC to make it, who have also made a the regular ruthenium plaque for us. BARC is also trying to bring back strontium. Strontium is a very good uh, radioactive isotope. The advantage of strontium is that you don't have to apply it and kept, keep it applied for say six, eight, 24 hours. It's just a local application over the bed of the tumor for a few minutes. So dosimetry is determined by the strength of strontium. Strontium has a very long half-life. You can use it for decades together. So it's a very nice device to have for local application. It can also be used for pterygium. To tumor regression for with radiation in patients who have scleral invasion is about 90% and 10% of course would need further treatment such as extended enucleation. The last bit is about advanced doses and can we salvage the unsalvageable. This is a young individual who at any cost wanted his eye retained. He had multiple excisions uh, referred from elsewhere, and you can see that he has intraocular extension. You can see ciliary body extension. You can see choroidal extension as well. He has a scleral invasion. There is no conjunctival tumor left, and he has extrative rectal detachment. He has some vision, but he, for whatever reason, his belief is that he wants to retain the eye. Well, we know that OSSN is not a tumor that metastasizes easily, so we can actually try to save his eye without uh, you know, having any additional risk for life. So we designed a stereotactic radiation for him and we applied what is called chemoradiotherapy, which is the treatment in, uh, you know, determined by head and neck malignancies, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, chemoradiation is one of the modalities of treatment. So this patient responded very well when we gave platinum containing chemotherapy, such as cisplatin and gave radiation Along with it, this worked well for this patient. He is rid of the tumor. His retinal detachment has also nicely settled. And on uh, UBM, you can see that he has no longer ciliary body extension and his choroidal extension has also resolved. We, I don't suggest that we do it for all patients, but if a patient is one-eyed and is the only eye that is seeing, potentially seeing, or if a patient is very keen uh, in salvaging the eye, then you can use these modalities maybe with limited success. Vaporization of conjunctival tumors, I already spoke about that's useful for lymphangioma. One more example of a lymphangioma that's been vaporized with multiple sessions and doing fairly well. Last bit is about target therapy. Everybody is talking about target therapy and conjunctival tumors are also amenable to target therapy, either as local injections or systemic treatment. This is a patient with conjunctival lymphoma, malt lymphoma, easily excisable, the anterior component. But unfortunately, patient has a component which is hugging the eye and go back, going back even beyond the equator. This is between superior rectus LPS complex, very difficult to excise it because it's kind of hugging the eye and going back posterior. Either we have a choice of radiation or we can use perilational rituximab. Rituximab is a drug of choice for malt lymphoma, we know that. And if a patient has malt lymphoma and we have confirmed that on histopath and there's no systemic lesion at all, then we can use perilesional rituximab, 5 milligram per ml, three weekly, six injections, and the patient is rid of that residual component. Now for melanomas, we have a nice uh, mutational spectrum and the target therapy all worked out. If a patient has a particular mutation, then use a particular target therapeutic agent. These are very expensive 
not easily available in india but some drugs have become available in india especially nivolumab has become available in india there are reports in the literature appearing on the use of pembrolizumab and nivolumab having effect on conjunctival melanoma this was our own patient where the patient had flat ocular surface recurrence this was previously excised patient had a history of pam and he had recurrence on the ocular surface and unfortunately at the same time he had regional lymph node metastasis as well since regional lymph node metastasis was a priority oncologist started him on nivolumab and within 6 weeks the ocular surface lesion started disappearing and 3 months later ocular surface lesions recurrent ones had completely cleared out from the entire ocular surface so there is a making a case for Uh, using these target therapeutic agents as primary therapy for patients who may not want surgery or may be too diffuse for excision so in conclusion i would say that in the last uh, 45 minutes or so i have taken you through lesions of the conjunctiva that you may or may not worry about and how to recognize each one of them and also some of the recent uh, therapeutic modalities thank you so much thanks uh, dr santosh for that excellent overview of uh, not just uh, pattern recognition but also how to recognize uh, and how to treat and uh, surgically excise these tumors as well uh, we'll go through some of the questions that have been popping up on the chat box uh, uh, to answer some of uh, the doubts that uh, people have put forth uh, so uh, first up one of the questions was that if you have a melanoma that is confirmed with histology does it need to be sent to a general physician for a systemic workup especially in children no it doesn't a patient uh, doesn't have to go to a general physician but an oncologist for sure or you can order the investigations are all very specific if it's a conjunctival melanoma then you do a head and neck pet scan it is unlikely to have systemic metastasis but regional lymph node metastasis is fairly common you can go by the thickness anything more than 2 mm in thickness or more than 10 mm in width definitely warrants a pet scan baseline and every year for 5 years that is the protocol for or um, you can send the patient to an oncologist and they would possibly do the same another question from nikhil uh, who asked that uh, some ossn don't seem to respond to interferon and the surgeon needs to decide if it's working or not or to change the therapy so how many weeks or months should one wait for response or if we see progression on the next follow up do you change your uh, therapy yeah so it so happens that some of the patients don't respond to interferon but they may respond to mitomycin or 5 to acyl and vice versa we have seen both so uh, one uh, thing i do is if the patient does not show any response at all in 6 weeks or is worsening then i would consider either surgery or switching over to from immunotherapy to chemotherapy or chemotherapy to immunotherapy and vice versa so that helps 6 weeks is my timeline to switch yeah himanshu so one question dr santosh uh, mm, when we uh, take a uh, my biopsy of uh, of oss and and specially like nikhil was asking that especially the edges where uh, it's so thin it's just epithelial and that area may just fold up so how do we uh, deal with that do you do you think that can be sort of uh, uh, wrongly reported as edge involvement or something or uh, if i remember you used to send uh, edges separately so do you still suggest that we should send edges separately yeah there are two options one is that i would uh, lay it on a filter paper whatman's filter paper flat absolutely flat my fellow does it and i look at it carefully on microscope again i would be doing cryo by that time and once i finish cryo I'd look at the filter paper carefully and then see if all the edges are laid out flat or if any of the edges are scrolling so if the edges are scrolling in instead wow. of you know fingering it again you might as well take edges again and send the edges separately there is no role for frozen section conjunctival tumors are not reported well on frozen section pathologists are not very confident so you have an option of sending edges separately if you cannot unscroll the lesion completely on a filter paper so i think there are a few questions about xeroderma pigmentosa uh, especially those who come with recurrent tumors 
is there any protocol to manage such patients Pseudoderma pigmentosa are recurrent tumors we um, manage with topical therapy or surgery as appropriate and try to avoid uh, radiation because they have a, a DNA repair mechanism abnormality and radiation is supposed to spawn new tumors so as far as possible we try to avoid radiation and treat them with multiple surgical excisions what is um, what i described as immunomodulation actually helps um, postpone some of these new tumors or completely get rid of new tumors so we have a bunch of patients who have been on immunomodulation and they seem to be doing pretty well and the frequency of have them having new tumors has gone down considerably So, Dr. Santosh, okay. is there any role of impression cytology uh, in ocular surface tumors nowadays? And if yes, uh, how do we go about it? Which area we target and how do we send across and how do we interpret it? Yeah, impression cytology is uh, not useful in ocular surface tumors. You know, unless to know whether it is an epithelial cell tumor or not. You'll only know yes or no answer, but you'll not know whether it is a carcinoma in situ dysplasia or invasive squamous cell carcinoma. So it will only give you the most superficial cells and the diagnosis of the spectrum of coexistence is mainly based on the depth of involvement rather than the cells that you get. So you'll only get a report that there are abnormal epithelial cells, you know, with cellular atypia and nuclear pyomorphism. That is all you'll get, but you will not be able to conclusively say which, where does it fit in in the spectrum of OSSN? In melanoma, obviously, it is not going to be useful because melanoma is a conjunctival stromal tumor. Even if it is an epithelial invasion, then the cells that you would get would only be reactive melanocytes and you may not get the real tumor. In lymphoma, definitely, it is not useful. So how is your threshold for biopsy nowadays? Uh, do you... Because of uh, the medical management now being much better, do you think your biopsy rates have gone down? And when you combine with uh, OCT, do you think uh, it makes you much safer that way? Yeah. Clinical diagnosis is never in doubt. But if you biopsy, it is only for the sake of excision. There's no need for incisional biopsy for ocular surface chemis neoplasia. There is no need for incisional biopsy for uh, melanoma. You want to completely excise it. There is a role for incisional biopsy for primary acquired melanosis. There is a role for incisional biopsy for, uh, say, lymphoproliferative lesion. So if it's a conjunct OSSN, then you choice dip of treatment depends on the patient compliance and also the configuration of the lesion. If it's a nodular lesion, you might want to excise it primarily. If it's a diffuse placoid lesion involving limbus more than six clock hours or a small lesion or involving visual axis or the corneal epithelium, then primary immunotherapy or chemotherapy would be the treatment of choice. So the rate of surgery has definitely gone down with all these topical therapies being available. I would say about one third of patients which you were earlier managing with surgery are now straight away without hesitation put on topical therapy and they work well. So here is a, a more cornea related question about the uh, side effects of brachytherapy in the clinic. How frequently do you see uh, ocular surface, uh, maybe uh, dry eye or melts on the uh, ocular surface with brachytherapy? Dry eye is not seen related to brachytherapy itself because it doesn't do anything to the lacrimal gland per se, but of course, uh, the tumor would have already destroyed the goblet cells in that area. So I don't know whether that matters so much or not. But it is not something that is not clinically unmanageable. Dry eye, I haven't seen. And uh, scleral melt is extremely, extremely rare. As I pointed out earlier, in melanoma for a 6 millimeter tumor, you, we give 10,000 centigrade to the height of 6 millimeter. And the sclera gets about 100,000 centigrade when we back calculate. Whereas in um, ocular surface tumors, we give 6,000 centigrade to 2 millimeter and the surface of the sclera gets about 8, 9, 10,000 centigrade. That is it. So the, 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 the dose of radiation is 10 times as higher for an intraocular melanoma as compared to an ocular surface tumor. The chance of melt is just theoretical. Yeah, Manchu? 
Yeah. So one question was there, Dr. Santosh, sometimes you see cases where uh, there is just keratin on the surface. There's nothing, no blood vessels and no fetal vessel, no internal vascularity. Uh, does it have any significant or what could be the reason of uh, such? And typically it stays there in one place only. It keeps coming back in spite of uh, removal. Uh, that, that may be a harbinger of an oversight. If it's a patchy keratin. But of course, bite out spot are very easy to distinguish. And, you know, yeah. So if it's a patchy keratin that keeps coming back after, uh, you know, if you just scrape it off, it comes back. That's a harbinger that there might be an underlying oversight. There are many questions which are uh, there and I, I really don't think there is going to be end to the questions which are pouring in. Uh, that's the reason I, I guess we all had requested uh, you all to send the question in advance so that uh, he could take everything in his uh, presentation. Uh, I, I think later on, if we have too many questions, we can compile them and we'll send it across to Dr. Santosh. And, uh, we can sort of uh, get back the answer and we'll uh, send it across to you. Uh, um, uh, any of the panelists, uh, if you have questions uh, or comments, please uh, go ahead. Can I ask one question to Dr. Santos? Yeah, sure. uh, sometimes we see uh, OSSN along with you know corneal involvement and especially corneal ulcer. When there is a presence of infection, how would you like to proceed? Would you like to start with uh, chemotherapy or, you know, you would refrain from uh, taking a scraping and uh, subjecting this patient for microbiological workup? What would be your line of management? I think you should manage corneal ulcer uh, as you would manage corneal ulcer even otherwise. As long as you don't have to do a therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty, it is perfectly all right to manage corneal ulcer exactly the way you manage corneal ulcer. If you are dealing with a lesion because of which uh, corneal ulcer has happened, for example, a lesion at the limbus because of which a delen formed and then there is an infective keratitis, then it is uh, possibly necessary that you might want to treat the lesion, the tumor also at the same time, isn't it? So safe surgery, as long as there's no corneal melt, etc., safe surgery can be performed. But if you think that, um, you know, you treatment of keratitis, bacterial keratitis is of paramount importance, then concurrent treatment with interferon absolutely does not interfere with uh, management of corneal ulcer. But would you, would you recommend even doing the scraping because we would be concerned about seedling of the cells into the... No, no. There is no such worry because when you excise it, you can include all that area where you are scraped in the excision. So it is not a killer disease, so to say, because it's, it's something that, is, that gives you a lot of time and a long rope before it even metastasizes. So we have, we'll have a lot of time to excise it. I don't think you should really worry about, uh, uh, you know, as a priority compared to uh, bacterial keratitis. Thank you. Great. So, um, so one question, uh, uh, which is probably not related to uh, what we discussed about ocular surface tumors, mm -hmm. several actually, uh, but I think uh, having having uh, been in the field of ophthalmology for like what twenty five uh, close to thirty years right now. Twenty five, yeah, that oh, yeah, including yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, what 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 kind of legacy uh, do you think you would leave behind uh, in ophthalmology? Because I think you already have a fabulous legacy. But is this something that you think about? Is it something that happened uh, just uh, by chance? Uh, I mean, what would you like to be remembered as always? Remembered as? <laughs> I don't know. Somebody I next. think he's too young to decide and um, think about those questions, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> it's still a long way ahead. No thought about it. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe what kind of message you would give to a young uh, ophthalmologist who are that young cornea surgeon we have here? Uh, many times we, we get uh, sort of confused in life uh, that uh, how do I go ahead and where uh, it's so crowded up there. 
and where do i stand my chance here i'm i'm down out here how do you plan your life how do you go about planning i don't know but i think uh, focus is very important whatever you want to do you have a focus and have a goal and work towards it i don't think you should get uh, worried about competition that gets sorted out along the way but it's mandatory that you should have a focus and work relentlessly towards your focus and have passion for whatever you do don't keep switching between things that becomes very random take your time to choose your focus as long as you don't know what is your focus it is okay to do general cornea general ophthalmology take time i i actually took about 3 4 years to decide whether i wanted to do ocular oncology or not i did general oculoplasty first and then thought that this is the area which interests me and then i got a second fellowship so it is it it doesn't really matter one or two or three years in life actually doesn't matter you might live five years 10 years longer if you're happy professionally and personally so i think it's necessary that somebody invest time in finding the focus and passion and then works towards it so do i understand that you 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 didn't have idea about you're going to do what you are doing now when you started your ophthalmology you know when i started my ophthalmology no i had no idea at all what i would do but uh, along the way oculoplasty interested and uh, oncology is mainly because there was a need when i joined lvpi i i saw you know patients coming with retinoblastoma and not getting treated because enucleation was only the thing that we could offer getting uh, and abandoning treatment and coming back after a year with a massive fungating lesion mm. so there was a need for treat i mean you know, some something that obviously that needed to be done so so it's okay to not have focus but keep your eyes open and search yeah. for it and maybe uh, you find something and you sail along that is okay. that uh, true or? yeah if you find something new that something that interests you then mid life makeover is perfectly okay who were your role models you you start from ophthalmology and then go ahead then different point of time i'm sure we all have different role models in different point of time and why role model and mentor i think um, my thesis guides uh, professor sous nikhil also i think has the common mentor we are both nikhil and i did the uh, thesis with professor sous and he was such a gentle soul and he, he is such a perfect mentor absolutely secure never 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 insecure about what his mentees would achieve absolutely secure absolutely grounded excellent advice never loses a temper and i think i wrote somewhere i i was presenting my thesis in rangachari and that was my first podium presentation ever outside rp center podium and this conference was in delhi and i had submitted my thesis and it got accepted as a paper and i was on the podium presenting rangachari and i didn't know what to do because i was absolutely scared all the big wigs it was a large hall full of people and dr sooth was in the front row and i had a tilt i would look at a particular direction when i spoke and he was sitting exactly in that chair where my you know gaze would be because he was always in the class when we used to present and i just presented to him i didn't know who was who else was in the hall i never bothered i presented to dr sooth exactly like i would present in a api center class and i won the award as a resident and that is credit of absolutely goes to him because he had corrected all the slide dr ramanjit had collected all the slides so i think he was somebody who we really looked up to as a mentor and he gave us the best advice at all stages of life later in your life when you when you got into oculoplasty and oncology well oculoplasty and oncology shields of course and for all else you know personal uh, pro- professional growth dr rao was a great mentor and he was so sensitive uh, to the needs of young faculty at the time that i joined 95 96 97 his his office was at the corner and we would do opd on the same floor on the same lane and he had the fastest computer at that time in his office and we had some slow notes sitting somewhere which wouldn't work and he he was connected to internet so he would just throw his keys at one of us me and lalit and dona we were on the in the same lane and we would use his computer you know he he knew our needs 
so we would go to his office and use his, that that was the only uh, good pc that we had in the entire institute so i think he guided all through for several years he guided all all of us in fact for how to go and present at the academy uh, you know we would have a trial presentation how to make a good poster how to win awards where to apply for which award how to apply what kind of uh, references would you need entire process he guided so i think he was a very good man what are the values which you never compromise and which you are always stand by honesty towards patient care and ethical patient care Nikhil or Gita or Paras, anybody else would like to question the man on the hot seat? Hot seat? <laughs> You're making me very comfortable. So in fact, I was just wondering that uh, so many youngsters will be now looking at Santosh as a, you know, maybe mentor, role model, or whatever terminology we may use actually, because uh, of whatever he has achieved in his career. as a teacher and as a person i think there are so many positive things whichever way you think about him and uh, so you know like a lot of youngsters would be uh, really uh, you know trying to learn from uh, santosh about how they should you know carry on their uh, practice or whatever we may say you know their uh, targets so that uh, maybe not close but they should also achieve good and uh, be happy in life I think I would like to just echo uh, Nikhil's sentiments that uh, Dr. Santosh is a role model for all of us, an excellent teacher, an excellent uh, clinician, an academician above all uh, uh, things. And uh, we would really like to thank you. You've always been a huge pillar of support uh, uh, for uh, the Konya Society of India. You have participated in so many of our carathons and our um, Uh, Kera connects, and it's always a pleasure to uh, listen to you and uh, learn from you. Thank you, Geeta. It means a lot. To you. So uh, today's talk, what you said, do you have anything which is documented in a chapter or online anywhere where uh, the members can go and visit and can learn yeah. uh, more? Because I mean, it's a, too much of knowledge to assimilate in this much time. we wrote up a ijo review article on oculus of students i think i can it's it's in the last 4 5 years so it, it's easily searchable so it should be there all, all these uh, things should be there and online would be a ao instruction course handout that is more comprehensive than the lecture so okay. it has a bunch of articles which are connected to oculus of students and entire uh, range of instruction including carol shields and carol cap all their material it's all there academy uh, instruction course material is easily accessible and free of charge so anybody can download it so we we will sort of get the link and then we'll spread it across the members and that surely would be very useful so uh, i think we we are reaching now nearly 8:30 in uh, fag end uh, of uh, this thing uh dr santosh i would like to thank you from bottom of my heart uh, for being here and for uh, teaching us uh, about uh, not just ocular oncology and ocular surface oncology but many more thing in life and uh, uh, the stature it, in which you are and you still being so humble and nice uh, that speaks volume about you i would really like to thank you uh, on behalf of conia society of india for being here and uh, It's always a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you so much. All of you are leaders in your own right. So thank you very much for considering me for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Very good night. Thank you. Thank you. so uh do we have uh, ec meeting during yeah it's it's not uh, disconnected yet are we still live